the, the, the chart you see in front of you uh, comes from my book, or Love Extended It to 2012. And it shows the comparative GDP performance of four countries, Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, Singapore, and Norway. You would note if you go back to 1960 on that chart that Singapore had a per capita GDP that was half that of Trinidad and Tobago. Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago were about the same. And Norway had a per capita income that was about three times that of Trinidad and Tobago at the time, three or four times. You fast forward to 2012, and you see that Trinidad and Tobago, oil rich, lots of oil and gas, has about the same level of per capita GDP as does Barbados, which is one tenth the size of Trinidad and Tobago and has no natural resources. And Singapore, which is a very small country as well, and also has no natural resources, has way outstripped Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados in terms of its economic performance. And don't talk about Norway. Norway has just simply gone clear. And what I, what I ask myself the question is, what, what accounts for this? And I identified a number of different factors, including mistakes in policy and poor implementation. But I also thought that one of the, the, the important factors was culture, that we had in Trinidad and Tobago a kind of culture that was not necessarily conducive uh, to economic efficiency and to strong economic performance. By culture, I mean the values, attitudes, and behaviors of our people. And what are those that are important? I've identified eight of them. I'm not going to necessarily talk about all eight of them this evening. Ambivalence, rules, and authority, Corruption and trickery, status and respect, time preference, amusement and leisure, or fetting if you want, <laughs> risk taking, and conflict and cooperation. There are two caveats I want to put forward. One is that those attributes are to be found in all societies. They are not, Trinidad Tobago is not unique in that respect. Those things I've identified belong to all societies. The second point I want to make is that within Trinidad and Tobago, that you will find that there are some groups, there are some individuals who don't necessarily share the attributes to the same degree. So that when I talk about some of these things, for example, you may well say that that's not me, and you may be right. But what I'm describing, as I'm describing really what is the modal behavior, the modal values that we have in this country. So let me first talk about the, the, the question of ambivalence. And by ambivalence, I mean that we are people who are pulled in terms of our standards and our values in different directions. Historically, we look to Britain to be the standards for the things that we consider to be important and to be valuable. We look to Britain for our leadership in terms of our jurisprudence, in terms of our economic thinking, and so on. More recently, we've looked to the United States because uh, we, we watch a lot of American television, a lot of American film, and so on. And uh, Eric Williams had a very interesting quote back in 1955. And basically, what he's saying is that, look, uh, we have a very good constitution that we can use. If it's good enough for Britain, it's perfectly good enough for Trinidad and Tobago. And C.L.R. James, who, as some of you may know, was a, was a Marxist, um, if, not, if, if not a communist, said in his book, Beyond the Boundary, he said, by age 10, I was a British intellectual at age 10, already an alien in my own environment, among my own people and my own family because he had imbibed the, the English public school code and culture growing up. This ambivalence has not left us. Uh, the, the, there was a case in 2005 um, involving Israel Khan, who went before the magistrate's court dressed in a Nehru jacket. The chief magistrate at the time, Shilman McNichol, said, no, you can't come to my court dressed like that go back and put on a jacket and tie, because that's how we dress in the court. 
The case was finally resolved in 2012 with a ju judgment which said a new jacket is perfectly acceptable and befit the dignity of the court in Trinidad and Tobago. But Israel Khan, in terms of thinking about his wearing of the Nehru jacket, had this to say. He said, and he was writing to Sherman McNichols on this, he said, I wish to have the option of exercising the right to wear something that reminds me from whence I came so that I can know where I'm going. So leave me with a little remnant of my heritage. A statement of ambivalence. If we look post-1970, post-1970, the Black Power Revolution and so on, and more recently among the East Indian population here, we've looked for our, to our roots in Africa, to our roots in India, to, to identify who we are and identify what kind of people that we are. The second attribute I want to talk about is rules versus authority. And V.S. Naipaul, who some of us don't like because <laughs> He tends to be rather acerbic, but also I think he's a very keen observer of Trinidadian and West Indian society. Describes our society at the beginning of the society when Britain took it over in 1797. And in that period of time, you had essentially what was an anarchic society. You had English law, Spanish law in a French colony. The place was just total confusion. And in that situation, you had a situation where there was very little in terms of authority. People did not obey uh, rules, they did not obey authority, and we, that has come down to us today. We, we have a situation today where I think that rule following is contingent. We follow rules if we think that it suits us to follow the rules. And if it doesn't suit us, we don't follow. We don't follow the rules. And we have that same attitude towards authority in Trinidad and Tobago. The, Third characteristic I want to talk about is corruption and trickery. Corruption is endemic in our society. It's endemic in our society because, in my view, what has happened to us is that we have had systems and processes that were put in place by, as a colonial society, and that we, the citizens of the place, didn't feel that those systems and processes worked for us. And therefore, our approach to any system, to any process, was to subvert it. If we wanted to get a passport, if you wanted to get a driver's license, what did you do? The first thing you do is you just say, who do I know that I could call? Who is my contact that I could call? And in that very process, what we are doing is that we are subverting the system. So that corruption becomes endemic. Brian Nancy is our heroic figure, right? He is, he is he's weak but he uses trickery to be able to get his way. And Naipaul, again, in the Middle Passage, talks a very interesting um, uh, observation, points out that, in fact, corruption in our society does not provoke moral outrage. In fact, corruption in our society, he says, provokes amusement and mild approval. <laughs> and he talks, uh, he talks about uh, the case of Balman Jones, where, uh, as some of you may know, this is back in the 1960s, Balman Jones was an impresario who decided he was going to, who told people that he was going to bring Sam Cooke to Trinidad for a number of concerts, including one concert to be the bit of an orphanage uh, for the orphan children. <clears throat> Charged $2 for the tickets. It was a lot of money in, in, in today's terms. And the night before um, Sam Cooke was supposed to appear in Trinidad, Balman Jones, with the money, hopped on a plane and went to Martinique. And it is very interesting to note the reaction of the population to that. Paul says, the Indian said, I don't see how anybody could vex with the man. That is brains. <laughs> and the other person says, is what my aunt say? She didn't feel she get robbed. She feels she paid $2 for the intelligence. <laughs> So what, 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 what we have is a society where corruption and trickery are what we consider to be normal. Status and respect. <clears throat> we are a society which routinely disrespects each other. People clamor for respect. You see it on the nightly news. When everything happens in society, people are burning tires, they're piling up rubbish, and so on and so forth. Because, and they, typically what they say is that we don't feel respected in our society. And in order to be respected, we have to 
assert that respect. We have to demand it, that respect, before we can get that respect. We are also um, status-hungry people. Eric Williams once said that social climbing is a major industry in Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> we have all inclusive fets, which we know are really intended to exclude <laughs> most people. And we have today, we continue to have people who pursue senior counsel, honorary doctorates, national awards, you name it. Why? Because status is extremely important for us. Time preference. What I mean here is not that we are unpunctual. We know that we are unpunctual. <laughs> but we share that in common with African societies and with Latin American societies. What I mean by time preference is that we are a people who don't think intergenerationally. At least most of us don't think intergenerationally. We don't, we don't worry about the effects of what we do today on our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. Now, let me ask, Norway is a country which started to produce oil in 1971. In 1990, Norway established their sovereign wealth fund. And today, Norway's sovereign wealth fund is of the order of 900 million US dollars. Billion US dollars, I'm sorry, billion US dollars. Trinidad and Tobago has operated this oil industry for 100 years. And we only established our heritage fund in 2005, and we boast about the fact that it's now reached $5 billion. Not thinking intergenerationally. Our approach to planning and to the environment is similarly due to the fact that we despoil the environment because we are not concerned about the intergenerational impact of what we do. Amusement and leisure. As I said, fetting is a very serious business in Trinidad, very serious business. But the point about, about fetting is that it is something which is ultimately unproductive and futile. It is, we have the phrase jumping up in steel band. The phrase jumping up in steel band says it all. We have 16 public holidays in Trinidad, including the two days of carnival. And of course, we could extend that, because pre-carnival, you have plenty of days that people take off. <laughs> and, and because of the way in which we have our public holidays structured, they will fall, or we, we turn them into long weekends. Right? I think we had two back-to-back -back public holidays recently, so we had a five-day or six-day long um, weekend. Risk-taking is extremely important in the sense that it, it drives economic activity and economic performance. But what is interesting is that you have um, what, what uh, one author calls a philosophy of non-possession. We see it in, Lo in Lovelace's uh, novel, The Dragon Can't Dance, where people uh, celebrate the fact that they don't have anything and they don't want anybody else to have anything either. <laughs> So risk-taking has not been part, at least certainly part of the Afro-Trinidadian society, has not been a part of the culture of, of, that we've had in terms of risk-taking and entrepreneurship. Conflict and cooperation. We are a society which has had uh, elements of cooperation, indeed. Um, we have had things like GAIAP and SUSU. We've had credit unions and so on, which have enable us to have some degree of cooperation in the economic sphere. But we are also a society which, which has a very peculiar approach to conflict. We have, I think, a, generally speaking, a, an approach which is initially one of conflict avoidance. So we do not tend to confront each other in respect of issues frontally and to debate and to discuss those issues with a view to resolution. We avoid that. But if the confrontation continues, there's a very rapid escalation then into violence. The thing just simply explodes into violence. We have not developed structures and processes and so on for effective mediation and the management of conflict in our society. And therefore, on the balance between conflict and cooperation in our society, what you find is that we have a society which is very prone, very open to conflict, which very often leads very, very quickly to violence. Now, the question that one has to ask in this, all of this is, can you then change a culture? 
which is the question that I've been wrestling with as I've been working on these sets of ideas. Can you change a culture? Can you change people's values, attitudes, and behaviors? And I think that the answer is yes. Because values, attitudes, and behaviors is not about DNA. DNA, we know you can't change. But your values, your attitudes, and your behaviors can be changed because they occur within a particular environment, within a particular context. And I have the notion of what I call operators inside the culture and operators outside the culture. We have in Trinidad and Tobago people who operate outside of the culture that I've just described. For example, pilots. Uh, although BWI Pal had a crash the other day, <laughs> but before that, BWI never had a crash. Pilots don't operate within the culture. When the pilot gets into the cockpit, cockpit his mindset changes. He's no longer Trinidadian. <laughs> a Trinidadian pilot might say, boy, you see that red light there flashing? <laughs> and the captain would say, well, I see that flashing before and nothing happened. <laughs> so, but, it, but our pilots don't operate that way. They operate outside. And another, another set of people who operate outside of the culture are the people, for example, who work for our foreign multinationals here. They're Trinidadians. They work for BP, they work for BG, they work for PCS Nitrogen, they work for companies in the Point Lisa's estate. And when they step in, to those plans, when they step into those operations, they stop being Trinidadian. They, they, they start to operate with efficiency, with regard to health and safety, and so on. When they step out of the gate, they will probably break the red light. As they do. <laughs> so I think it is possible to create workplace cultures which embrace a different set of values and attitudes and behaviors, and which can shift the overall culture towards one which favors better economic performance. Who does it? Well, the elite in the society have to do it, which means that all of us here have to do that. Thank you.